So, Dishonored has been recommended to me several times, and it's easy to understand why, having gone through it now. But one of the things that really struck me as amusing about Dishonored is how incredibly lacking in subtlety it is. I don't mean that as an insult, by the way, as some people might. But rather, the game overall just tends to basically beat you over the head with its message, its tone, and its characterization. It's not really a bad thing. It's just, uh, it, it's sort of its own unique style. It doesn't hold anything back whatsoever. It, probably Lady Boyle's party is, I'd say, the most blatant example of that throughout the course of the game. So this is a very depressing setting. We have here a setting in which we've got the rats things, which it has already been described, in addition to the fact that they can chew to get apart a corpse within minutes. Um, these are not normal household rats, these are Pendician rats, and there's even worse than the Pendician rats over on Pendicia. And then there's the levels of corruption in the setting. Now, to make this clear, the reason I bring this up, because this is one of the first things that occurred to me, I feel like this is a deliberate logical fallacy on behalf of the the game, because it they try to paint it as though everything went to hell when Burroughs took over. But while that certainly didn't help anything, and it you know, especially didn't help with the salvaging of the situation, I can't help but notice that there's a lot of things in this setting that clearly were already terrible. This is a setting that was already a hellhole. And it brings to the mind that age-old question, and one I love to see in my fictional works, does this world deserve to be saved? And it's funny, because even though I mentioned the lack of subtlety thing, it is subtle in one key element, because the game constantly beats you over the head nonstop with the corrupt politicians and the corrupt officers and the corrupt criminals and the corrupt soldiers and the corrupt nobles and the everyone's corrupt the corporations are corrupt the people the whalers are corrupt and the very society is corrupt 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 and yet if you pay attention there's an undercurrent there to the innocent there's actually a line by the outsider, something along the lines of, it's funny how there's always a little bit more innocence to be lost. I like that. Um, but one of the things that I like about that... What the... Uh, sorry, one of the things I, I like especially about that is that it it kind of encourages you to dig a little bit deeper. You hear about people who are just depraved, and then you hear about people who are kind-hearted, who are courteous, who want to help others, who have a kinder side to them. And a lot of this is revealed through the heart as you use it to interact with just ordinary NPCs, like guards is probably one of the most prolific examples. And I like that. In other words, it's showing that while most of the named NPCs are fairly despicable individuals, that's because most of the named NPCs we interact with as a, by, you know, as a byproduct of the plot are despicable people. The politicians, the military, and the religion who are on top of the heap, who are all fairly despicable people. But when you really look at the overall, the message that the game seems to be getting across is, yes, this is a diseased world, but there's still good people in it. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because by the very term diseased implies that there's something still healthy there that is being sickened by something else. External. And that brings me to my next point. The Void. Now, I find The Void to be very fascinating in the context of this game. And abstractly horrifying. Um, so, some of the information I'm going to be sharing is stuff that has been tweeted or otherwise discussed by uh, Harvey something, I can't remember his name, but one of the main leads who worked on the game. He's also a gentleman who worked on uh, Deus Ex and a few other big, you know, good games. Um, so, in this game, in this setting, excuse me, if you die and you were tainted or evil or horrible, your uh, punishment is you get to go to the void and slowly have everything go nightmarishly horrible for you f until you eventually are consumed. But what's the reward if you're a good person, if you're untouched? Oh, that's obvious. You cease to exist. There is no afterlife. That's how dark this setting actually is. The best possible outcome is you die, 
and then nothing ever happens after that. And for a setting that is a fantasy setting, let's make that clear, uh, this is very much a fantasy setting. That's pretty dark. Um, the Void itself I find fascinating for other reasons, though. It appears to be basically the source of the fantastical within this setting. All the aspects of monsters and magic and myth mythical, mystical things all seem to be generated from or as a byproduct of the Void. My personal theory... Uh, and I know there's a lot of evidence for this and a lot of evidence for other things. This is probably one of the most generic theories I've ever tossed out because it seems to be just kind of what they intended. But the idea is that the the void birthed you know, the earth, the world, the plane that they exist on. And it was kind of an unintentional byproduct. The, the world, not the void. And that uh, the world is connected in several ways, both physically and metaphysically, with the Void. Uh, one of my favorite d demonstrations of this is the very first time we go to the Void, where we see events that are happening in the real world. They're just frozen, and we only see shattered pieces of what, what is happening in the real world. There's also the implication that events in the Void can affect the real world, and the real world can affect the Void uh, equally. And the general idea that you and your actions can have a literal and metaphysical effect on the world around you. Um, so, for example, for those of you not aware, there's basically three ways to play this game. I'll be talking more about the gameplay later. Um, loved the gameplay, by the way. I'm actually looking forward to Dishonored 2 now. Um, you can play super secret stealthy, uh, trying to be passive, but otherwise still killing people, or murdering the crap out of everyone you see. Okay. Now, if you do this first one, when you get to the last mission, it's a sunny day, it's bright, shining. There's not that many guards. In fact, it was actually one of the easiest missions I did uh, with my preferred playstyle, which, for those curious, was never be seen and never kill anyone. Um, and so I was... Uh, it was just nice. Ah. Of course, because I didn't have time to play through the game twice, I ended up YouTubing some of the other side of things to see cutscenes and dialogue and help flesh out characters. And the last mission is this horrifying weather storm, dark, doom, death, where as you go up, you know, the flare is shot off and everyone's on alert and there's tons of guards and tons of combat. It's like, oh, God, death, doom. It's easy to look at that and say that that's a gameplay choice by the designers, because it was. But I think it's in character, too. I think that this is an aspect of your actions having a literal effect on the metaphysical world. In other words, in lore, if Corvo is this murdering psychopath, the world is turned into this dark, night nightmarish thing. Although I admit one of my other theories about this game kind of contradicts that. I'm going to save that for last, though. Um... One other thing about the Void that occurs to me, it reminds me a little bit of something from Warhammer 40k, the warp. It reminds me in many, I mean, several aspects of it seem similar. It's just with the absence of the, you know, the nightmarish things that exist within the warp. Uh, one thing that's implied is that contact with the Void or interaction with the Void ruins things. You know, it makes things worse, corrupts them, taints them. And yet... And I was paying pretty careful attention. The entire playthrough, I never saw any hint of that. Not one. Certainly there are individuals who can do horrible things with the power that the outsider gives them, but as I've said many, 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 many times, I do not believe that power corrupts. I believe that power enables. And we kind of see this with doubt as a good example of that, but, I mean, several other examples exist. It's not like being handed power suddenly is this key, unlock key that's like, Aha! And now I will kill people! at least in my opinion. So I don't think that there's any innate corruption in that. Uh, unlike some settings where there is an actual corruptive element to certain types of power. That's different. I mean power in the enabling you know, tool utilization sense. Um, so I'm not sure there is any corruptive essence. And in fact, I'm reminded of a game I actually looked at recently, Dragon's Dogma. Or, no, wrong game, wrong game. Uh, Divinity Dragon Commander, excuse me. The two blur a little bit in my mind. Dragon, dragon. Uh, in Divinity Dragon Commander, all of the high-tech, high-advanced, super-mega stuff they have with the airships and the tanks and all that stuff, all of that is demon technology. Something from ex external to the world entered it and gave them the knowledge and information necessary to build these marvelous machines. And I get the very strong impression 
that that's exactly what we have here in Dishonored. That most of this new high science and high tech stuff, Sokolov's inventions, Piero's inventions, the very utilization of whale oil as a primary currency, or not currency, excuse me, wrong term, uh, fuel source, all of that stuff was stuff that was inspired by the outsider, or by the void, or by both. And thus the idea that this is a setting that eschews change. To explain what I mean by that, one thing a fictional writer, a writer writing a fictional setting, not a fictional writer, I'm a fictional writer, no, uh, has to decide is why. Why did things happen this way in your given setting? And usually most writers just hold it as not lo logical that people will just advance and change over time. But the impression I'm given here is that in this setting, the world is so dangerous and so violent and so volatile, and there's so many horrific, dangerous, nightmarish things in it, and there's a lot that are mentioned a lot of times, completely separate from the corrupt nobles and the void and anything else. There's just lots and lots of nightmarish beasts and creatures and, and terrain and, and all that fun stuff all over the place. I mean, the blood flies in the second game come to mind immediately, and that's not, there's not even a plague associated with those. So there's all of this horrible stuff the implication is that the humans would not be able to get anywhere unless someone was giving them a helping hand. Now, don't mistake me for saying that I think the outsider is helping humanity. I think it's more like the outsider is perceiving things from an alien perspective with a human sentimentality underneath that. The idea that he wants to do something, but he doesn't think like people do in the same sense. So he introduces change chaos, if you will, into human society, and that allows for the progress and advancement and all the fun things that happened as a result of that. And, of course, makes for a very fun, uh, very awesome steampunk feel to the work. Um, the uh, I also have to mention that the heart, just really quick, uh, the heart that you're given. First of all, I was like 95% certain that it was actually, you know, the Empress's heart. And then it was 100% confirmed by the gentleman in, you know, the comments I mentioned earlier. So, I mean, that was kind of obvious. Same voice actress, a lot of things she said were relevant. But it makes sense for another reason. I think that is that same perspective from the outsider. In other words, he's got that human sentimentality coded in an alien perspective. So this is his idea of something he's doing that is a beneficial thing to you. Reuniting her soul with Corvo. So that in some way she will be able to continue to be with him and him with her. Not understanding, thanks to that alien perspective, how nightmarishly horrific that is for both individuals. And yeah, that's pretty screwed up. <clears throat> There's several obvious uh, parallels in the setting to real life. I actually made a few notes here. Uh, some insist it was copied. Some insist it was not. I don't actually know. Uh, so apparently Dunwall is, of course, London. Gristol is the greater England area. Circonus, I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing these correctly because some of them aren't actually said out loud, is supposed to be either Greece, Italy, or Spain. Tivia is supposed to be Scandinavia and Russia. And Pendicia is supposed to be either uh, Dark Africa or Australia. Australia makes more sense to me personally. Um, I only mention that because I don't, based on what I've seen and read, I don't think this was intended as a deliberate uh, pull. I don't think that they, the, the writers should should get demerits, or not demerits, wrong word, uh, should get de negative marks for that. Plenty of fictional works use real life as an inspiration because it's the only thing we technically have to be inspired from if you really want to get down to it. And there's been plenty of other works that have been able to pull this thing off without you know being blasted for it. Dragon Age comes to mind immediately. So I don't really, I don't really get that negative criticism. And it doesn't bother me at all. Um... Uh, playing through this game, well, let, let's actually let's let's say this. Let's talk about a couple of things really quick. The political realities of this game are interesting because so one of the most relevant parts of the setting is political power is a big deal, obviously, but there is real power in this setting as well. In other words, you know the magic and the abilities that Corva has, that kind of a thing that Dowd has, um, but it. The political power's balance requires you keeping your supporters happy, but that balance is so easy 
to be disabled, to be to be disrupted, if you are caught just outside of the norm enough in order to upset people. Now I mention that because <laughs> the Empress clearly had an interesting balance over the power of the city. But as I mentioned, many many things were already wrong with the city prior to the plague prior to her death. This was still a city that had a lot of issues and a lot of problems and a lot of corruption amongst amongst its aristocracy, as most aristocracies tend to be portrayed for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I mention this because Burroughs himself seemed to actually rather keenly understand that point, and so did Havelock. Both men and their overall plan revolved around ensuring that people were very loyal to them and that those people had a tight rein on one of the three major groups that control the political reality of uh, the city whose name I just forgot, Dunwall, excuse me, <laughs> um, and the nation, the military, the religion, I'll talk about that in a bit, and of course the aristocracy. What I find most interesting is that as we're going through, and I'll talk more about this later, we learn that most of these people are pretty despicable in their own right. Yeah, actually, I'm going to save that. Let's let's just move on. Let's just move on. Uh, I do like the fact that, as with most works of fiction, because real power only exists in fiction, uh, political power absolutely melts and fades away in the face of real power. Despite this web of influence that Burroughs has made, Corvo dissects it. And then, despite the web of influence that Havelock has, you get my point, it, it can't withstand him. So, yeah, let's talk about the church. Um, the church... So, uh, the thing I find most fascinating about this church is that it's a non-belief church. That's not quite the way I want to put that. It's a non-spiritual church. That's probably a better word. Because they do have a belief system. Their belief is that the outsider is bad and evil and wrong, and that the void is bad and evil and wrong, and we need to fight them in these very, very you know, strict rule sets and whatnot. And that's interesting, considering that in this setting, it's pretty definable that the outsider exists, that the void exists, that's where the mythical and the mystical come from, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the fantastical element being added through his influence. So their opposition to that strikes me as hilarious if my previous theory about, you know, the, the source of inspiration and change in the world being from the void is true, because it means that this church is trying to oppose progress. Please don't turn this into a political debate. I just re I realized in the middle of that sentence how that sounded. <laughs> Let, let's leave that on the side. Let's leave the real world out of this. Let's just look at the fictional world for a second. In the fictional world, I find it fascinating, though, because it doesn't feel like all of the people involved are doing it just for political reasons. There are certainly some who are. Uh, the previous High Overseer, I don't even remember his name. Did I write down his name? I didn't write down every character's name. The one you assassinate or brand. Did I write down his name? Uh, looks like I did not. Oh, well. Um, he clearly did not actually believe in the tenets of the faith of the F Abbey of the Everyman and all that. But there are there's a clear indication that a lot of them actually do and really do believe what they're talking about and how this is the proper course for man and blah, blah, blah. Now... <laughs> This probably is deliberate allegory for the real life things that I don't want to talk about. And the and I can give you one fairly distinct reason why. When I was doing the infiltration mission to take out the overseer I just mentioned, whose name I don't recall, I was sneaking through and I overheard a conversation. And they're just discussing, you know, the outsider and how he infiltrates us and blah blah blah. And I was just kind of listening with half an ear until I heard the line paraphrased. My uh my wife's sister lives with us, but she does not cook or clean. And his tone with how he said that, I'm trying to emulate his tone. She does not cook or clean, like it's some outrageous thing. And she wants to learn how to read, and she wants to study books. What should I do? As if it's this horrifying thing that this person should want to study and learn and, and, and be a person. Um, which is, what? <laughs> um... I found that, I actually was so startled by that t conversation and laughed so hard, I actually got caught by someone and I had to reload a save. 
Um, but of course, there's tons and tons of hypocrisy involved as well at basically every level. I mean, of course, the High Overseer himself, and I'm quoting the heart here, likes to break all seven of the sacraments or whatever as his own little joke. And a lot of the religious people regularly violate their own rules. Probably my favorite example of this is Lady Boyle's party, which it's a great mission. It's probably my favorite mission uh, in the whole game, actually. And uh, not the most satisfying mission, just, just my favorite. And if you pickpocket people there and are caught, you don't get in trouble, at least under certain circumstances. Instead, they say, oh, don't worry, everyone does it here. <laughs> and one of them actually has a mention about, oh, yes, I've been pickpocketed several times already. I had my servants sew in an, an inner pocket just in case. That's how petty, how pathetic, how hypocritical... How disgusting, how corrupt the aristocracy is overall. They have no problem literally lifting from each other. And that's completely ignoring all the other many, many signs of it. Which brings me to a point. I thought about listing all the examples, but I've decided to explain instead. I want you to imagine for a moment that I'm Bob Ross, and that you are painting something, okay? Let's try to paint a river. I think that's probably the best way to get across this example. I was originally going to go with a road, but I think a river works better. So you've got... Uh, here, I'll pull a pen up. You've got your paintbrush, okay? I know this is a pen. Just pretend it's a paintbrush. Use your imagination. You can do it. And you paint a river like this. One big streak, okay? Now, if it's blue, and it's going through, like, a grasslands or whatever, people looking at that are probably going to be able to tell it's a river. It's a river. You can even tell them, it's a river, and they'll be like, oh, okay, and they'll probably associate it with a river in the future. But it's kind of crude, and it's kind of amateur. That is not what Dishonored does. Dishonored does this. And it adds hundreds and hundreds of little brush strokes as it's going through the story. I'm speaking metaphorically, of course. There's lots of different dialogue, lots of different scenes, visual indicators, a decent amount of visual storytelling going on. There's tons and tons of things throughout the whole game that paint this river so that when you look back at the hundreds of brushstrokes that were expertly crafted, you don't even have to think about it. It's a river, and it's a beautiful river. That's what Dishonored does with its themes of hypocrisy, with its themes of corruption, with its themes of how screwed up the world is, and with its overall themes of the, the gray morass of people that I mentioned earlier. Even Dowd is someone who does have a conscience. I'll talk about him a little bit later, though. Um, and it does not bril- it does it absolutely brilliantly. Um, like, like just, I, I mean, this is a setting in which the country is basically going to hell. It is. It needs strict, it, it needs serious leadership and serious effort in order to, 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 to steer the rudder. It, it's a ship that is sinking, but is not unsalvable, as, as we prove. And it could still be salvaged, and we need to do something about it. And so most of the leadership involved of the religion, and the military, and the aristocracy, and the corporations, which are not mentioned a lot, they're in the DLC from what I understand, where you play as Dowd, but they are mentioned several times in the game as well, brushstrokes, um, are all just interested in their little piece of the ship as it goes down. They're not trying to do anything to help the ship right itself. They don't care about the fact that the whole country is going to hell and there's you know, family and friends who are dying horribly. No, they care about their own little piece of it. It's immensely petty when you really get down to it. For all their supposed power, for all their supposed might and wealth and affluence, we see that they are ultimately only a little bit more comfortable than those others who are still alive and are soon to be dead themselves if the course is not corrected. One of my favorite little tidbits is a line about how this city was actually built on the bones of another old city. I'm not going to go into the full details. It's a little conversation between two troops. It's nice. There's a lot of eavesdropping you can do in this game. Again, brush strokes. Um, let's talk about the gameplay a little bit, which is awesome. I really, really enjoyed the gameplay. Uh... 
so right in the beginning we have this hide and seek thing as well as several other little tidbits which are awesome for several reasons not only do they are they an excellent way to tutorialize and it's optional but it's a good way to help develop characters tutorialization for gameplay woven into story is something the game does a lot of if i was streaming this i would be able to show you all the little different ways they did this i'm not going to because i'm not streaming this because this is not a lore run this is a rumination but there's several aspects where they do what I would actually call textbook tutorialization. I mean, seriously, it's straight out of Super Mario World, um, which is what I consider to be the textbook on uh, game design tutorialization. Um, in other words, you encounter... Uh, I'll give you a specific example, one example. It's the only one I'm going to mention. You uh, see a little swarm of rats, and these people open the door, and they just get mauled by the rats, okay? Then you go a little bit further and you see another situation where the rats can you know, run towards a corpse and deal with it. And so now be between these two incidents, you now know how the rats react with living people and how the rats react with dead people. You know how to avoid them yourselves and you know how to distract them. And thus, in those two things, and then there, there's like two puzzles after that, Half-Life style puzzles after that, that you have to deal with the rats. And you would now have the tools, the information at your disposal for how to do that. You don't need some big, you know, person. Okay, so for this section, I'm going to need you to understand that the rats are going to swarm people. They didn't need to do that. Now, there are a few circumstances where a big old pop-up just bounces up and says, here's the way this works. But in the overall game design and level design, which, oh, God, I can't praise the level design of this game enough, um... They, they, they show you how to do things and they emphasize how things work before you have to really engage with it, before you have to really interact with it. There's another example of this too. When you go through the area to the to religious guy's place, then when you go through there again, all the security has been beefed up, but it's okay because you know how it all works now. It's all been tutorialized to you. Um, I was reminded of Thief when I was going through this. I was reminded of Oblivion. I was reminded of Fallout. And that sounds weird, but I got a very strong feeling of it. When I did a playthrough, one of my playthroughs of New Vegas, I actually uh, basically was in stealth like 99% of the time. I would unstealth when I got to town, and when I left town, I would re-stealth. And that's kind of how I played this game. Now, granted, I was going for the no kills, no spotted thing, um, which I almost pulled off. But, uh... Yeah, uh, that, that's part of why I felt that way. And, and, you know, the Oblivion thing for the same general reason. But the Thief parallel uh, was certainly nice. Apparently that was a direct inspiration. But the one thing I didn't realize until my friend Pax really put a, a label on this was that this game reminds me a lot of a Hitman game. Let me explain what I mean by that. This game is mission structured. So you go into a mission and there's, you know, specific loading zones and it's a very contained environment. But at the same time, those contained environments are brilliantly designed. As I, as I said, I cannot begin to praise the level design enough. They're designed with, and I know I've been talking about this a lot lately, the all roads lead to Rome gameplay theory. In other words, you are playing a linear game. Your choices do have effect on things, mostly cosmetic or flavor of the story and whatnot. But for the most part, you go from point A... You get to point B, there's some side quest stuff in the middle, and when you get to point B, you neutralize your target, either by killing them or by doing the, you know, the, the non-lethal option. And the non-lethal option is always fairly apparent. There's no ex there was no time in which I was like, what the heck am I supposed to do here? It was always, there was someone I could overhear, or there was something I could find, and in general, I always had some way to know, here's how I'm going to do the non-lethal option. And as I'm going through this... Um, my point is, this is a linear path, but the way we walk on this path is totally up to us. Um, I actually have borrowed, I, I like borrowing this analogy because Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, actually came up with a wonderful analogy for this. This is the path. We're walking the path no matter what. So, like for example, if I am walking, I am walking a straight line from point A to point B. But let's say I've got a leash, and there's a dog on the leash. The dog's going all over the place. He's over here, sniff this, sniff this. He's straying, but he's not actually leaving the path, really. He's just going all over the place, whereas I am effectively the path. This is the gameplay All Roads Lead to Rome concept in action. In other words, I can take whatever route I want to in order to get to the end there. I could go full stealth, I could go partial stealth, I could kill my way through, and even that doesn't describe the options I had. There are so many different ways, and the level design, again, I praise it so much because if you max out, you know, time stop, or if you max out sprint, or if you max out possession, there are things, set pieces throughout the stages designed to help you progress with no matter what you've done. In other words, 
no matter what you've leveled, no matter what you've specialized, there is a method to get from point A to point B. And that is brilliant level design. I haven't seen a game do it this, do that specific thing this well since the original Deus Ex. You can truly play this however you want to, and it's awesome. Um, and it's probably my favorite aspect of this game overall. Now, I kind of gave this away. Uh, I was playing this on Super Stealth. And with one exception, I never got spotted, never raised an alarm, and never killed anyone. <sighs> so I'm on the mission going to Dowd, right? In Dowd's lair. And I've got this guy over my shoulder. And I, to this, I'm not actually sure what happened. This was actually a couple days ago. Uh, like four days ago now. So I'm, I'm really not 100% sure what happened. And I didn't even realize it until I had already basically overwrote the save. So I'd have to restart the whole mission in order to fix this. So I'm going through. And I'm up on like the, the little upper brick wall levels in the ruined building. And something happens and I let him go and he falls down. You know, falls down a cup, uh, like a story or so. Now, I didn't... There was no indication that he had died. So I'm just like, all right, whatever. And it wasn't until I finished the mission that I saw one kill and the no kill thing wasn't checked. And I'm like, what? And it, I realized that's the guy who died. And I, I later did tests and looked up to it. Apparently, you, you can't even drop someone like five feet or else they die. Uh, I found that on the very next mission, actually, which, which really irritated me. Um, and if I might tell a story really quick. So the next mission, the Loyalists mission, where I'm going through the Loyalists uh, area, I had a lot of fun on that mission. And at the same time, it was also extremely frustrating. One thing I would do in this game, and it's a shame I wasn't streaming it, is I would, uh, anytime I would screw up, that's not true. Every now and again, if I screwed up and I was getting frustrated, I would just go on a massive murder spree and kill everyone. <sighs> you know, calm, relaxed, reload, <laughs> and try to do it better this time. I ended up doing that a lot on that mission because I kept screwing up because the patrols were actually quite smart they would recognize where other people should be patrolling so to step up from the AI and they would always find the freaking bodies and I was trying so after the the no kill thing was stolen from me in the previous match by something for those of you who curious no I didn't hit F I have no idea why he just jumped off my shoulder like that but whatever I have a theory that it was because I was pushing up against the wall and like, like there's no room and so it assumed I wanted to drop him or something I don't know like, maybe if you jump up a wall, it lets go of your guy. I'm not sure. But, uh, so I was pissed off. So I wanted a flawless record. No bodies found, no alerts raised, no kills, no spotted, nothing. Complete ghost, right? So, um, I don't know if you've played that mission, but there's, it's a fairly tight area with, you know, several levels and lots of guards patrolling and, uh, recovering each other's patrols. And so I'd be like, all right, and I, this is when I learned, uh, to use time stop extensively was on that mission because for like, for example, I'd be wandering on all of a sudden I'd hear someone in the distance. Oh my God, get up. What's wrong with you? And I'm like, ah, crap, someone found a body. So I'd reload, walk down, figure out who did it. And I'm like, oh God, he's like, I'm on the third story. He's on the first story. So I'd time stop and then sprint down the stairs in order to get there in time and then try to grab the guy and knock him out before he spots the bodies. They're not corpses. I mean, I haven't killed anyone. So I'm like, come on. And I had to do that a couple times just to get the timing right because I had so little time. I had like a couple of seconds in real time in order to make it. So I'm like, come on. Um, but it was still fun. It was still enjoyable. Lots of freedom in how you play that game. Uh, and I've got another big thing to talk about, but I want to kind of save that for last with regards to the gameplay. <sighs> um, I will also say one other thing. Uh, the game lets you choose your own difficulty. I don't mean by choosing the difficulty. I mean by if you're doing just a kill everyone run, it's kind of easy. I actually did one mission just... so. Uh, it was like the second mission uh, when you're going at, back into the alley area after you take out the religious gentleman. And I'm going through there, and I do the stealth mission. It took me maybe an hour and a half, two hours. It was a fairly long mission. Then I decided, because I wanted to test it for the rumination, to go through and just murder my way, just beeline for the target. It took me about 15 minutes, and it was very easy. So if you care about never being spotted, never having a corpse found, and never killing anyone... It's actually quite hard, and I had several difficulties and had a lot of reloads in order to get through that. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the challenge. If you just want to get through without killing anybody, and regardless of the other things, well, that's that's its own thing, and it's it's easier. 
there, there's less you have to do, less you have to cover, less you have to think about, and less reloads. If you want to go through and you don't give a damn, you just want to get to the end, you could just murder, mass murder your way through. And it's very easy. I like that kind of dynamic gameplay, you choose your difficulty by your actions rather than adjusting a slider. One other thing I noticed is going through that way, there's several things you're just flat out denied, certain rewards and a lot of the money you can't get if you're doing the ghost playthrough. But you don't really need that much money on a ghost playthrough because most of the things you can spend money on are either consumables, which are frickin' everywhere, or upgrades for your combat, which you'll never do. By contrast, if you go murdering your way through everything, it's very easy to loot the hell out of everything, giving you lots of money for lots of upgrades for your combat. Smart design choice. Um, I will say one other thing, even though we're technically in the... Uh, the gameplay section still. First of all, I want to praise the Lady Boyle uh, mystery mission itself. Again, I really like that. I like it when games kind of take a break from the norm. And I can just go around and kibitz and talk and listen to all the little dialogue, of which there's quite a bit, and it was some cool stuff and some horrifying stuff as well, of course. If only we had a good war. Um, but I really liked the deduce who the Lady Boyle was thing. For those of you not aware, the, the correct of the three is actually randomly generated on each playthrough. Uh, supposedly when you enter the mission, uh, I'm not 100% sure about that. But regardless, that was cool that it did that. And of course, <laughs> the non-lethal there is horrifying. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about this here. So... All of the non-lethals are pretty horrifying, and I'll, I actually am going to be building up to that point, so I'm going to talk about that more later. But the Lady Boyle one is you basically give her over to her secret stalker crush, who's going to ensure that she, she never sees the light of day, and she will eventually learn to love me. She'll have lots of time. The actor says it in a way that's not really creepy, but it's creepy as hell. And in fact, the developers have flat out said, we probably went over the line with that one, but it's okay because the, the developers then kind of pseudo-retconned it, so instead of her being, you know, this chained slave forever, it's more likely that what happened is that she eventually coerced and charmed her way into, you know, wrapping the guy around her finger and then just took over, uh, which is a little better. <laughs> um, the betrayal mission, I have to admit I saw coming. I saw the betrayal coming from a mile away. But it was for two reasons. The biggest reason is actually the story and the presentation of which, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We're still talking about gameplay right now. Because the gameplay reason why I saw it coming was that the, the area in which you are, you know, your home base area, felt like a mission. The overall design of it, and the nearby sewers, and the nearby docks, and the buildings, and the platforms, and all the little planks up there, that stuff doesn't exist for flavor. That's part of level design. And you see that in all the other levels. And I kept looking around like, I'm going to have a mission here, aren't I? And of course, between that and the story thing I'll talk about later, it became more and more apparent that I was going to end up either breaking my way out or breaking my way in or something because I will be betrayed by the ironically named loyalists. <laughs> I have a note here. It's odd how non-lethal methods are clearly... Good, but aren't... Oh, yeah, speaking of which, I do have to say one thing. I like this game a lot, actually. But I do have to say that several play, uh, several characters in it do seem to kind of grab the idiot ball for certain sections of it. A lot, a lot of it's surrounding the betrayal thing I mentioned earlier, actually. In defense, um, Havelock himself flat out says that, you know, we were afraid. And there's some ways to make that make sense. And it also makes sense because in the you know, the good playthrough, the non-lethal playthrough, they betrayed you because they were afraid and scared and desperate and hungry for power. They were corrupt. In the evil playthrough, a.k.a. the mass-murdering psychopath playthrough, it makes perfect sense. In fact, it's the right thing to do, to try and do everything they can to kill Corvo because he's this mass-murdering nightmare who they are deathly afraid of. So, uh, a couple little tidbits here. Um... I, I'm just going to kind of go down the list here. So first of all, there's adverts in the sewers, taped up there. Now, I know this sounds like a weird thing to comment on, but that actually says a lot for the state of this city, that there's enough foot traffic and enough interest in the commercial and marketing aspect of people wandering in the sewers to bother to go down there, send people down there and try to send, put up adverts for, you know, for, for, for commercial goods. Again, another sign of the fact that this city was diseased and rotting long before the Empress died. There's a quote, let the rats eat them. 
It's funny because, uh, so we of course know that the plague was brought on by Burroughs, but the plague was spread because of people. P Burroughs himself actually rants about this. He's like, oh, why didn't people just follow orders? But, and of course he wanted a very orderly society, and I'll talk more about Burroughs in a bit. But um, that, that mindset, just let the rats eat them. One of the things I like about the game, and, it, and it's a smart decision, is it explains flat out. The more you kill, the worse the plague gets. There will be more weepers and more guards. Now that makes sense. More guards are necessary because security is being upped because of all these issues that have been happening and all the deaths. And there's more weepers because the plague is spreading more. Because you're creating more bodies. Corpses, which aren't really being disposed of or dealt with, which are infest infested nesting grounds, and of course, a source of food for the rats. So, the thing is, though, even regardless of Corvo, people have already been contributing to this problem. And, again, I bring it back to that quote. Just let the rats eat them. And if you don't understand the context of the quote, it basically someone says, aren't we supposed to take these corpses to some other place to be properly disposed of? And the one guy says, nah, I don't feel like carrying them that far. This is paraphrased. So, let the rats eat them. There's also another really horrible thing. Again, this is part of the paint, paint strokes thing. Where... Uh, they're they're loading off corpses into a, a barge, basically. And one of them says, hey, I think that one was moving. It's like, impossible. I inspected all of them personally. Are you sure? And then the, after questioning whether or not they just threw a living person into who's wrapped up in swaddle into a pile of plague corpses, his response is, eh, he ain't moving no more. The total apathy on behalf of some of the characters regarding the dead and the suffering is nightmarish. So, um, let's go down the list here. So, first of all, let's talk about the Fugue Feast, or the Fugue Feast, depending on how you want to pronounce that. In other words, the Feast of Doesn't Exist. Anyone seen the movie The Purge? Because it's kind of like that. Basically, the Fugue Feast is the one point in time in which time does not exist, and they try to use the knowledge of the cosmology in order to determine the next uh, calendar date and all that fun stuff. And, uh... It legally does not exist. Obviously, the day actually does exist, although I did find myself wondering how much that day actually exists, thanks to the rather fantastical and metaphysical nature of the world and how much the void affects the Fugue Feast Day. But it's kind of a nightmarish concept that there's just one day. It's the same thing that actually intrigued me about the premise of The Purge, even though the movies didn't handle it that well, was there's one day where everything's legal. Have fun. That's pretty horrible. <laughs> I wonder how many people just build up to that over the year. Um... I also find it interesting and odd that the watered-down elixir still works. This is mentioned in several pieces in several places where the uh, the one that Slack John and his men are selling, it actually still helps prevent the plague from spreading, despite the fact that it's cut so thinly. I find that very, very fascinating, and uh, it makes me wonder how much of that plague cure is metaphysical, is, is basically magic, as opposed to medicine. Um, let's talk about Piero, speaking of which. Piero's awesome. He's portrayed by Brad Dorff, so of course I'm a huge fan. Uh, he manages to s never sound creepy, despite actually being kind of a creep, uh, with the whole beeping through the whole thing. But, um, I do like his overall interactions, and he does come across as a fairly decent person. He's an interesting twist on the mad scientist, because he's a very well-reasoned, very calm, and very driven scientist who is very grounded in reality. He understands full well how weak and powerless he is. He's the one who tells Corvo, you know, you're the one who can wade through a sea, an army. We don't have that ability. Sokolov is an interesting contrast to him, then, because he is, of course, trying to, you know, the whole absent-minded genius. He's a little closer to your typical mad scientist. But he also has his own issues. Like the fact that, uh, or not issues, excuse me, his own self-awareness. For example, when you first confront Sokolov, he's, he blusters and threatens, but it takes only seconds for him to just melt. For him to just be like, oh God, please, and beg for his life. Because he's sufficiently self-aware to understand that he is ultimately powerless. He has no real power. Um, and he's smart enough to recognize that, and I liked that. Um, he also tends to despise the trappings of society, which ad I admit also makes me automatically positively inclined towards him because of that. But uh, he does seem to be very much about the science! I also find it very, very uh, fascinating because he is an indirect example of one of the themes of the work, which is 
what you do with something, not what the something is, is what matters. This is something that's mentioned several times. You know, a weapon is a tool, of course. Uh, my blade was never bloodied throughout my playthrough. But it is how you use that tool. You know, the very concept of science being used for good or evil or whatever. Sokolov himself inventing many things that help to uplift society and to crush and ruin it at the same time. It is how that technology, how those tools, those neutral things are used uh, that actually is relevant. It's a concept of choice and consequence, which is another one of the major themes of the work and President Korva himself. I already talked about The Outsider. Um, I don't have actually much else to say about that. Uh, Samuel is interesting because, in my opinion, there's only three good people in this game. Samuel, Emily, and the Empress. I'll talk a little bit more about the Empress later where it's a little more relevant. But all I want to say about Samuel is that he serves as a enjoyable... Kind of a Jiminy Cricket sort of a uh, character because the things he says and how he talks and how he interacts with Corvo are a pretty good lead on exactly how you are on the moral compass and during your playthrough. Um, I want to mention briefly Granny Rags. I don't have much to say about Slackjaw other than the fact that Slackjaw is surprisingly decent of a person for being a criminal underlord. But Granny Rags is... So first of all, I actually ended up looking this up after I wrote this note. I had a theory, you know, I m mentioned here that I theorized she was much older than she appeared because of the way she acts and because of several things around her. It turns out that even, I was actually half right. She is, in fact, immortal, but she's not actually that old. She's only in, like, her 80s or whatever. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I also, uh, the, uh, what? Oh, right. The, her, the interaction with her also kind of helped to emphasize how you really are encouraged to think for yourself. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes like, what am I saying there? Because um, if you save her from the thugs, that seems like a fairly decisively good thing to do. Yet, as we know, Granny Rags is really messed up and actually wants you to poison the still that they're using to send out the elixir. Not a brewery. He, she wants you to poison the cure. Now that, I was actually about a third of the way through that mission, just kind of infiltrating the factory, when it just kind of slowly dawned on me, hang on, I'm going through here, and I'm about to poison the cure. I was still willing to go through with it just to see what happened. I made a backup save, right up until I saw the note that actually mentioned how even the distilled cure still worked. In other words, this is, a, this is not just a neutral evil act, uh, neutral act leading towards evil, this is an evil act leading towards psychotically evil. I decided not to continue that one. Um... The I mentioned the overseers thing already. I don't have anything else to add about that. Uh, and there's of course the boil party. Uh, the boil party is extremely well visually directed. Uh, be, there's so much opulence on display with the food and the drink and the the occasional confetti going off. Look at the ceiling sometime in there. They actually have these things set up that will just occasionally dispense confetti. How long did that take to set up? How much money was burnt on something that's literally just that, that nobody in, involved is even appreciating? And everyone there is talking about how boring this party is. I mean, really? And of course, there's a lot of backbiting and and you know rumors of plague and all that fun stuff. Um, uh, so let's talk about uh, three characters, then I'm going to kind of wrap this up. So let's talk about the Lord Regent first, Burroughs. It is my opinion, and I'm probably going to get some flack for this, that Burroughs is one of the least evil characters that is not the big three I mentioned earlier. And I mean that sincerely. I think he is paranoid to the point of insanity, and I think he is a little bit too lawful neutral. In other words, he only cares about order and not any moral or ethical compass. But he, it's very clear that he actually didn't want to seize power initially. In fact, in, in his own, in his own uh, confession, basically, he flat out admits, no, I, I kind of wanted to, you know, be in a situation where I could bring this to the Empress and she could deal with this situation. Now, I'm not saying he's a good man by any sense. He is someone who wanted to get weed out the unfit by plague. He wanted to go and plague people who were beggars or homeless or criminals and just get out the undesirables of society by such a method. That is extremely short-sighted and ethically dubious. Um... But he was not as power-hungry or as petty 
as most of the other people involved, which is what I find fascinating about his character. He seemed to genuinely care about several of his supporters, some of them, and he seemed to be the kind of person who really was trying to make things his own twisted form of better, which makes him even more interesting of a villain. Probably my favorite line of his is actually when you when you betray, or not betray him, when you, when you expose him, and the guards come up, and he's like, I'll, I'll make you rich men if you let me go. And the guards... This is going back to that, you know, not everyone is corrupt and evil thing I mentioned earlier. The guards say, all the money in the world will not save this city from what you've done. I liked that. Um, I also uh, find it hilarious that he, him killing the Empress was basically just a secondary effect of him not being able to plan ahead. Let's introduce a plague into the city. Oh, crap. Now that now they've figured out. Oh crap! Okay. Um, next step. Let's kill the Empress. Oh crap! Corvo's there. Okay. Uh, let's blame it on Corvo. Oh crap! He doesn't know how to think more than for a spy master. He certainly has very short-sighted plans. Uh, let's talk about Dowd. Now, the thing I want to talk about most about Dowd is I've seen a lot of people complain about Dowd by saying, "Oh, he on the low chaos." Oh, excuse me. On the low chaos playthrough. He seems to grow a conscience, and they hate that. It's like, why are they trying to lighten this character? He's a murdering bastard. He's an assassin, a professional assassin. Why not just kill the guy? I will say that the term growing a conscience is very accurate, though. Because this is my implication, this is my interpretation. He flat out admits, and we see in his playable thing, that he just goes around and kills people who are, let's be honest, bad people. For the most part. I mean, he kills one noble, he kills another noble, he's hired by a noble, and then later kills that noble. They are bastards. We've already seen so many times how the aristocracy consists of rotting, corrupt, decadent, diseased, sickened people, right? So it never bothered him. Killing didn't bother him because, I mean, it's like squashing an ant at that point. Or wiping out a disease in his mind. He was able to just consider it that way. And then he had to go after the empress, the point here, and one of the things that most people complain about, is he probably shouldn't have taken the job if he cared that much. But I don't think it ever occurred to him to. I think he was so in his rut, so grooved in, um, that he at no point did it occur to him to think of her as anything other than one other noble that needs to be killed for some other noble. And then when he sees the impact it has, and when he starts researching her after the fact, and when he starts brooding on it, he starts to realize that he has done something that is unusual in his career. He has killed an innocent. He has killed someone who was a better person. And that's why I say growing a conscience, because at that point it occurs to him what he's been doing, and the fact that there is still something out there that is better than just rats fighting over other rats for pieces of a, of a dying ship. And I like that presentation of him as a character. I also like the Im strong implication that the Empress was a good person. Um, oh, and in case I don't mention this, just someone will probably say something if I don't mention this. Uh, yes, it has been confirmed, both in character and out, that uh, the Empress and Corvo were together, and that Emily is his daughter. There's lots of hints of that in the game, but it's been confirmed by uh, the developers. I mention this because I find myself wondering... Uh, well, I like the agency that's put on the player for being good or evil, and I'll talk more about that later. I'm still building up to it. But it makes sense to me, because one of the things I was talking about during that Skyrim interactive roleplay is you can control the impact, the, the, the thing, the impetus for change in a character. And as a writer, you then have to decide how the character reacts to that, because it is equally logical equally sense-making for someone to have this traumatic event happen to them and for them to rise up and be a better person or be crushed by it and be a worse person. These are both equally viable things to happen to a character. We get to decide that. After Corvo lost his, his lover, his love, let's actually use the correct term here, he could become a despicable, murdering psychopath or he could prove to be a better man and get his vengeance in a slightly more ironic way. But I'll get more to that in a moment. Um, last person I want to talk about is Havelock. Now, I mentioned I saw the betrayal coming. And the other reason, the thing that really made me think I was going to be betrayed, was Havelock. Havelock was speechifying a lot. And good, very, very props to the voice actor and the writers. It very much sounded like he was trying to convince someone of something every time he talked about something. He didn't 
talk to you like a person. He didn't talk to you like someone who was desperate. He talked to you like someone who was part of the problem, who was an aristocrat, who was a leader, who was trying to convince someone of something. He speechified. And the more I saw of it, the more I saw him and Pendleton, it's like, okay, these are not good people. These are not people who want to make the empire better. These are people who are basically throwing in their lot with what they believe to be the best possible chance here for a going forward future. Because there was no future for them in supporting Burroughs. Burroughs already had his supporters. He didn't need more. They thought, we'll go ahead and have Emily. We have our puppet leader. We then have all the power and we become the new supporters of this new empire, right? But I want to say one other thing here. He comes across as very clearly power hungry. This is one of the first things we learn actually through the heart is that he tried to seize control of the military and failed uh, <laughs> fairly shortly after uh, the Empress's death. But he... I love it. The Loyalists are rats on the, on the sinking ship just like everyone else. And I feel like they may think otherwise. I feel like they're convinced that they're better than the other aristocrats, better than the other leaders, better than the other rats scurrying about the diseased ship. But one thing that makes it fundamentally clear that they are not is the way they handle and deal with the other members of the Loyalists. Murdering their fellow workers for no other reason than trying to have a scapegoat. Seeking the death of the two most brilliant minds in the Empire and possibly the world because it would be convenient politically to use them as a way to uplift themselves. And of course, trying to manipulate and control a 10-year-old girl in order to try and make things right for them. Not for the Empire, for them. Yeah, I think it's fairly clear what side of the fence they're on. At least Burroughs was a paranoid idiot. These people are power-hungry and willing to do whatever is necessary to do it, including betraying their own allies. To my knowledge, other than the Empress, Burrow never actually betrayed an ally. But I've been building up to a point here. One of the things that weirded me out about this game, even before I played it, because I knew a little bit going into this, is that killing people was portrayed as evil, and sentencing, sentencing them to something worse than death was considered good. That always struck me as very odd, and something that I didn't agree with. I, I, as I've said before, uh, I think that the concept of worse than death, A, exists, and B, is worse than death. So for me, if you're going to kill someone, or consign them to something worse than death, killing is the mercy in that circumstance. Now, I know that's a very contentious topic. I don't want to get too much into it, but the point is, regardless of morality and ethics... It seems strange to me that the, way, the worse than death thing was considered the good option. And it's so universally praised. All the people praise you and show that you're morally, ethically strong. And the, the society gets better. The missions actually get easier because there's less troops and there's less weepers. I mentioned the thing at the lighthouse where everything's nice and clear. There's so many examples over and over and over and over that if you do this horrible thing to these people, it's good. But if you kill them, it's bad. And that really didn't strike true with me until I really realized why that was. And it's funny because it does this in a very blunt way. It's pointing to you, the player, and your actions are being judged as good or bad. And you are getting the benefit of good or the benefit of bad, depending on your preference. It's not about Corvo. It's not in character. Corvo, in character, in my opinion, is someone who will refuse to kill people who are effectively just accessories. In other words, anybody other than the main targets. And will consign them to a horrible fate because, A, justice, and B, revenge. And possibly even vengeance. That's the in-character perspective. The out-of-character perspective, though, is it's harder to do the good thing. As I mentioned before, it ups the difficulty if you have to go through and not be spotted and not be seen and not hurt anyone, not kill anyone. And you decide as the player how you, the player, want to play through this. Do you want to do the difficult thing and do you want the rewards that come with that? 
people praising you, people telling you how awesome you are and how you're making this a better place and how you're uplifting the world and uplifting these people because you, the player, decided to not do things the easy way like so many other characters in the setting do. Or do they revile you and hate you, but you get lots of monetary reward, I mentioned the money thing earlier, and you get to just blaze through and absolutely dominate everything because you, the player, have decided to do things the easy way and violently excise the cancer. If I could use an analogy, it's like having a patient who has a cancerous lump and either spending time and effort and work and research in order to try and slowly excise it from the person and hope that they recover, or grabbing a knife and doing that. And I like that it is actually, again, wonderfully blunt in how it presents this to the player. I've got nothing else. I probably missed some stuff. It's, there's a, like I said, there's a lot of brush strokes in this game, so I probably missed uh, fine details here and there. But nevertheless, great game. I enjoyed it. Uh, I hope to play Dishonored 2 as a premiere run at some point. Uh, not immediately. I'll be playing Tyranny instead. And by the time you're watching this, maybe I will have streamed Dishonored 2. Who knows? Anyways, either way, I will see you guys next time.